It's not pretty to see the spread of philosophy in which the spoils go to the ruthless, the predatory, and the shrewd. The most precious symbol of human hope and faith dies under the weight of distrust and despair. Give me Canada, and I'm thankful the choice is mine to make. Now, maybe that sounds like hokum. Maybe it's not smart to get sentimental about your country. But after seeing what I've seen, maybe I'm not smart anymore. Maybe I'm just grateful. Oh, I know our land isn't perfect. I know we've all had high hopes about a sort of millennium that was supposed to be just around the corner. Post-war is the word for it. I know we dreamed bigger and better dreams than we could ever make come true, but at least we dreamed, and we made the bigger part of those dreams real. Canadians and their dreams have helped to change this world more in a hundred years than all the labors of mankind in the centuries that have gone before. Well, I'll soon have my feet on the soil that offers a measure of greatness to the smallest of us, if only we accept it. I don't know, but it seems to me that in spite of some broken dreams, shortcomings, disappointments, there are a lot of things we can take pride in. Of this, we are proud. Yes, Canada struggled to glory through trials and emergencies that are remembered and trials and emergencies that are forgotten. But also she was carried to greatness by humble hands and honest hearts. The hands that guided the plow. The hands that split the rails that laid brick on brick and drove the nails home. The hands that asked but little and gave everything. The homely virtues of your full money's worth. Of honest dollars put by for a rainy day. Of a good job well done. Oh, there were some who sold short and lined the pockets and padded their vests. But Canada survived this and forged ahead. In spite of all obstacles, Canada spread out, a trickle at first, and then a flood. Like the rivers of spring, her people surged across the land. And as life grew better, shaped in the factories and foundries of the nation, 
they carried the good life with them. The nation came to life in the wilderness. Yes, here is Canada, the nation, and of this we are proud. men dream great dreams and inspires them to bring those dreams to life. Dreams of opportunity that became reality when the first axe rang in the first forest on the shores of the St. Lawrence. Dreams of freedom that took form in the deeds of heroes and substance in the gun smoke of the plains of Abraham. The history books trace the record of our dreams through French and English rule, but beyond the wars and politics has loomed the spirit of another Canadian dream. It was the dream of a better way of life. This dream was tuned to the sound of hammers on anvils, of chips flying away from lathe tools, to the music of saw teeth in fresh timber, to the fury of liquid metals spilling into molds. It began to achieve reality when clapboards and two-by-fours replaced logs. When a man built a house next to a neighbor and another man built his house next to that. When paths grew into roads, roads into streets, its beginnings were coincident with the beginnings of Canada, where they recognized the rights and freedom of the individual. With the birth of the system of competitive enterprise, men could dream great dreams, and fulfilling those dreams, reap their rewards. In the first place, our country was peopled by those who could dream beyond the established order. They were people unafraid of change. The timid and the satisfied never crossed the Atlantic. The settlers then, like Canadians now, could not be content with the ways of the old world. They were always reaching out for improvement. And there was always someone to dream up better methods. There was our industry to keep pace with our dreams and translate them into reality. There were salesmen to travel through the country bringing improvements into the life of the nation. 
The old oaken bucket in the open well had a nostalgic charm, but someone dreamed of a better way, and they worked out a new system. Even that was not good enough. Even when improved, the pump was too far from the door, and so the dream nourished in our system. created new jobs, produced more wealth to buy more products, and established the expanded industrial pattern on a firm foundation. Once it was a great problem to keep food in warm weather. To meet the need, the iceman appeared on the scene. He cut ice from frozen rivers and lakes in the winter and stored it in ice houses to be sold to city customers in the summertime. This, in turn, created the need for the ice chest to hold both ice and food. At first, this need was supplied by local cabinet makers and carpenters. But the demand was so great, it called for a new industry, the manufacture of ice boxes. And Canadian achievement took a long step forward. As the demand grew greater, Ice was produced artificially in huge quantities, and the ice business itself became a vast industry. In the meantime, the young electrical business was beginning to expand, and homes by thousands were being wired. At first, electricity was used only for lighting, but there were men who dreamed of harnessing it for most of the household chores, dreams fulfilled by appliances that are commonplace today. And foolish as it may have seemed years ago, there were men who even dreamed of keeping food cold by electricity. And so it was that in 1914, an epical achievement took form. From the dream of a better way of life came an electrical machine which in an ice refrigerator would automatically maintain safe temperatures. Thus, the gigantic electrical refrigeration industry was born. Today in Canada, industry is building refrigerators and other appliances such as electric ranges and home freezers. Under our system of competitive enterprise, it has grown to a great instrument of service to the nation with dealers all over Canada. Yes, all over the world. With hundreds of thousands of men and women directly or indirectly deriving their livelihood from this vast industry, all because we wanted a better method of keeping food fresh. And thereby came into reality one phase of the Canadian dream of a better way of life. But in spite of Canadian industrial progress and all it has brought us as a nation, 
We have loud critics condemning us, critics who cannot see beyond the chimney smoke, who hear only machine noises in the song of Canada. Those critics say our dream is soiled with commercialism, that competitive enterprise does not lead to a better way of living. They say our soul has been pulverized in meshing gears and spinning turbine buckets. Well, is competitive enterprise bad, or do we have no soul because we prefer bathtubs to washtubs? And washing machines to washboards. We even like our waffles light and our toast the right color. Is there any point in keeping a wood pile when we can wire in an electric range? And why let our food spoil when electricity can keep it at the right temperature? We can't see why this isn't definitely a better idea than this. Yes, our dream of a better way of life is commercial. Its accomplishment is born of competitive enterprise. It has marched the power lines across the land and up to the farm country. With each passing day, it's spreading the better life beyond the borders of the cities and towns. It took the old oaken bucket, streamlined it, chromium plated it, and brought it right into the kitchen. It brought up the old well water and left it cold or turned it scalding hot at the flick of a wrist. Why, it has even made a streamlined pantry that has winter inside, that would keep fresh almost anything in the way of food for months at a time. It fixed things so that the farm homemaker could fry ham and eggs, broil a steak, or cook anything else simply by turning a little knob. Why, it made a little gadget that will whip up a cool breeze on hot summer days. And it made another gadget that would whip up a cake. And still another to keep the temperature of the whole house just right in winter. It fixed things so that vegetables would always be crisp, fruit, fresh and cold, and all other perishable foods in perfect readiness for meal making. Still, we have critics. But in spite of what they say, most of us are proud of our way of life and our dream of higher living standards. But beyond these paltry critics are a more deadly few who are bent on destruction, who would haul down the structure of the Canadian way of life that their own faulty philosophy might rise above the ruins. It is they who cry that free enterprise has failed. Well, does the fact that we in North America have more automobiles, radios, electric lights, telephones, than all the rest of the world put together, that we have more homes with electric ranges, refrigerators, heating and plumbing, mean that free enterprise has failed? No, they mock its triumph. Let us hold fast to that triumph and perpetuate its glory. Yes, the shining reality of our achievements is bitter gall to the demagogues, and they rant on. The freedom they attack gives them the right to use their voice against it. But they are voices pitched against the wind, humbled before the wave of the Canadian spirit. And this spirit runs deep. For the Canadian spirit was not born in battle alone, but in the forges and on the anvils of fledgling industry. It was born in the hearts of men with the will to work and the right to accomplishment and individual enterprise. The Canadian spirit is compounded of the spirit of competition and the spirit of achievement and the spirit of striving to make work easier and life better. Our sons and daughters died to preserve that spirit, the Canadian dream. For us, the living, the task is to work and to build, that the dream may go on its great way, confounding the detractors and false prophets to that distant time when it shall see complete fulfillment, to that day when life shall be good for all men. In that day, 
They can look back to our contribution to the life of peace as we of Canada look around us in our own time and say, of this we are proud. <laughs>